you, Simon. Well, thanks, Simon, and good evening, good evening, uh, everyone. Um, welcome along uh, tonight. We've been asked, uh, Emma and I, between us, to to give you something of a a labour perspective on on business, and I want to try to do that in a few ways, really by rooting this locally and talking about what some of our what I think some of our strengths are, maybe where one or two challenges are as well. As Simon said, I was a previously a minister for business uh, some years ago now uh, at a tough time for the country. It's, it was during the financial crisis when the banks had stopped lending, when everything seemed to grind to a halt, and when, uh, as a government, we tried to throw as much help as we could into the system, including not just what we did for banks, but trying to get the banks moving again on lending and so on at that time. And it was a really, a really tough time around 10 years ago from, from now. But I just want to make a few points about the interaction locally between uh, politicians and, and business too. Obviously the business people here, you run your businesses, you make the decisions, you create wealth, you employ people. But I think it's really important that politicians understand this and take it seriously. Now, when I think of my own constituency compared to uh, some of the areas that other MPs around the country represent, my constituency has an awful lot of work in it, like many constituencies in the black country. There's an awful lot of businesses there doing all sorts of things. Some of my colleagues in different parts of the country represent constituencies which are almost entirely residential, no major workplaces at all. So I think being a black country MP in an area like this, to begin with, gives you a different perspective. And I regard visiting local businesses and seeing what they do and hearing the stories of how the business started and grew and so on as a big, um, a big part of my job and part of the reason is I think if you aspire to be in government then you should take wealth creation just as seriously as you take wealth distribution. In my view any serious party of government should be just as serious and just as interested in wealth creation as we are about wealth distribution because it's tempting for politicians to say we should spend this much on the health service, we should spend this much on education or this much on policing. And we talk about that a lot. But the only way that we have anything to spend on public services is if we have a healthy economy with thriving businesses that are growing and doing well. Now, in the last six to nine months, I just want to mention a few of the local businesses I've visited and what I've learned. Uh, for example, We've got uh, Learn Play Founda Foundation in All Saints. This is an absolutely fantastic business creating online learning products for use in schools and all sorts of other areas. And anybody who hasn't been there, uh, it's, a, it's a really fascinating tech-based businesses with dozens of really brilliant, bright young people working in it. Uh, I've been to Metal Spraying UK, a local scaffolding company that are trying to pioneer the use of plastic instead of wood in scaffolding in order to cut waste and have a, a product that lasts much, much longer. I've been to a bigger business, Asa Abloy, where uh, they're innovating to such a degree that they told me that soon keys are going to be obsolete and we'll just be waving our mobile phones at things. I don't know what happens if you lose your mobile phone, but uh, that the key is becoming obsolete and the technology of locks and security is completely changing. I've been to the Bilston Energy Centre, which is trying to get people the best deal on their fuel, fuel bills. I've been to Asan Wood Saints, a new social enterprise based on recycling wood. I've been to Mako, a Bilston engineering business, which was celebrating the purchase of a new CNC machine purchased in part with help from the council and European funding. Uh, and of course they asked me what would happen with future funding uh, of that kind of thing in future. And uh, the other day I went to Pallet Track, one of our distribution businesses locally based on the Millfields Road. 
Uh, and I called in as well to our old friends at Tarmac, who we might think have completely left the city, but they haven't. They still have a, a research uh, laboratory uh, which is, which is researching the materials used for roads, the temperature at which they can be used, and so on. So I try to make it part of my business to keep in touch with these companies, to learn their stories, and I think it enables a politician to be much more in touch with the area that they represent if they, if they do that. Now where would I stand on the, the overall picture, the glass half full, half empty question if you want? Uh, locally, we've had some headline grabbing fantastic investment in, in recent years, most obviously the JLR plant which I, I read in the Express and Star I think today or yesterday which is now employing 1800 uh, employees, it was originally built to employ 1400 so that's doing really really well at the moment. In my own constituency we've got major investment in Wiggle, the cycling group which is employing hundreds of people there, but we've also had more difficult stories, and Simon mentioned the most obviously the collapse of Carillion, uh, which was a nationally, internationally renowned business uh, based here in the city, collapsing uh, a few months ago. I try to be an optimist. I think Wolverhampton's a good place to invest in. I think geographically we're located in a great place. I think the council wants to have uh, a business friendly environment, and Roger's here and can say more than that, more about that than me. But obviously over the years it's been a mixed story and we've got to build on those successes I mentioned like Wiggle and JLR that we've had recently. It's impossible to have a meeting like this without talking about the, the B word. Uh, and maybe we'll leave most of this for, for Q&A, um, but Emma and I on the, on the Brexit committee are dealing with this every week and whether you are for leave or remain and I think you all know where I was and where Emma was on this argument I would say this about Brexit which I think is unquestionable I thought through my work as uh, for a while a business minister in Shadow Europe spokesperson and I'm sure Emma thought the same that you were pretty well plugged into these issues before the referendum but I found out something new about the implications of this that we didn't really discuss, probably on a weekly basis, uh, be that the implications for universities, the implications for creative industries, the implications for manufacturing industry, the implications for the ports which we visited, the implications for agriculture and so on, a whole number of things. There's a story in the FT yesterday about the implications for the UK space industry. You might not think we've got a huge UK space industry, but we actually have one that employs thousands of people doing work on satellites. Will we be able to take part in that in the future or not? So the point I make, I'm not going to try and rerun the referendum arguments here. What I would say is this is inescapable in terms of its of its uh, of its implications for uh, business. Uh, one of the crunch issues, of course, is going to be this issue around the customs union. At the moment, we are part of a common customs area. No barriers, no tariffs, uh, one common market. To what degree will there be barriers put in the way of that in the future? If we pull out of the customs union, the answer is quite, quite likely to some degree. If we don't, maybe not. And as we speak, there's a debate uh, about that going on in Parliament at the moment. But there are other things, for example, something like the REACH Directive, which governs the chemical industry. When this came in, there's a bit of grumbling, people thought new regulation, we don't want that, and so on. It's now the other way around. It's, can we stay part of this? Uh, because we've now got a common set of rules, which everybody across Europe works with, which is now the global standard, and we'd like to be part of that in the future. That's what we hear, certainly from the businesses and sectors that we that we speak to, uh, so that is inescapable. But I don't I don't think I need to say more than that at this stage because we will just have to see how all this is is negotiated over over the coming months. So my my take on this is obviously that we need successful and growing businesses. There's a huge 
enterprising tradition. Here in the black country, there is a huge tradition of creativity. I think that gives us a great can-do attitude. Uh, it gives us an enterprising spirit. And I think in the variety of the businesses that I've mentioned tonight, you can see that showing itself in all sorts of ways. But we do have challenges too. And I want to, I want to just focus on one, which I think is very prevalent in, in my constituency, but across the city too. Let me just give you some numbers. Um, my constituencies, there's 650 constituencies in the UK, each with their own MP. So in that league table of 650, Wolverhampton South East is and has consistently been in the top 20 of those whole 650 for unemployment. So for all that the figure's gone up and down over the years, relative to the rest of the country, it has remained stubbornly high. Uh, if you're interested in the figure, it's currently now around 2,000. 800 people unemployed or 6.9% of the economically active population. Average pay <coughs> in my constituency is, the flip side of this, in the bottom 20 of the, all the 650 constituencies. Average pay is, for full-time workers is £440 a week compared to £550 across the country. Now what's behind that stubborn reality of higher than average unemployment and lower than average pay. Well, I think it's got something to do with the, the third set of numbers that I'm going to give you. Um, if you take England as a whole, 30% of the population has a higher education qualification or above. 30%, just under one in three. In my constituency, it's one in 10. Just 10%, just a third of the people have a higher education qualification or above. But if you take people with no qualifications at all, no formal qualifications, the countrywide figure for that is 8%. Less than 1 in 10 people in England as a whole have no formal qualifications. A quarter of the working age population in my constituency have got no formal qualifications. So I think these things are related the high unemployment, the low pay, and this disparity on qualifications. And I think that for all the enterprise, the creativity, the good side of the ledger, unless we do something about this qualifications issue, we will never give people in this city the chance to fully fulfill the opportunities that might come along with new investment, with new companies, and so on, because when I meet business people, one of the things that they say over and over again is about finding the right people, finding the people to do the jobs. That that's the essential thing in helping making a business successful. So I think we've really got to focus on this as a city. Some of it is about uh, a long-term industrial legacy. I know that. There has been some improvement in school results in recent years. But we've really got to take those numbers, less than one in 10 with a higher education qualification and a quarter with no qualifications at all, and resolve to change those radically over the years, or else the people, people are going to lose out on uh, the chances that we would want them to have. So it's not just about uh, infrastructure and investment and all of those things. Crucially, I think it's about equipping people to do the jobs that are there and even more importantly, the jobs that will come tomorrow. That's enough for me, and I'll hand over to my good friend and neighbour, Emma.